a pig thyroid and smashing it up and making a delicious, what desiccated a means, deli- yeah. a delicious tablet for you. <laughs> What's going on, podcasting world? Welcome back to another episode of the Core Console RX Podcast. My name is Mike Corvino. With me, as always, Cole Swanson. Cole, what's going on, man? Doing good. We're on our own today. On our own. No students today. No students, no guests. Nothing. Just us. Just us. <laughs> Only our voices. What are we going to talk about? I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, no idea. We're just going to have to wing it again since we didn't have to plan anything. Yeah. I'm getting the hang of this whole... Uh, pharmacist thing i think yeah yeah settling in first uh full week as a really licensed full, pharmacist full month i guess now yeah when did you yeah i guess we started, license on the uh, 25th of june oh has it been so that long? tomorrow is the month anniversary hmm I should get myself something yeah you should and i also should figure out what month it is and date because i thought <laughs> it's only, it feels like it's only been a week yeah it's been a crazy month yeah it's been quick i um, learned that i just love love dealing with the general public oh man don't we all they are the best the uh, have you had a lot of problems with the Velsartan uh, recall? Oh, it's been a pain. Yeah, yeah, mostly just answering questions. I mean, we're refunding people and taking meds and just having to explain, which I don't know a whole lot about how strong the correlation is to cancer or whatever. But yeah, I haven't. I, looked. I, I just you know tell people, no, it's no big deal. Don't worry about it because there's nothing they can do now anyway. Right, you know, and even already... even the CDC is saying don't stop taking the medication. Right. If if it, you were on one of the recalled manufacturers, right. still take it until you can get it switched to something different. Right, that's so. what they said. But um, but then we, our company, was kind of recommending that people stop it. So now I kind of have to fall in line with that. But if they're worried about it, then I'm like, yeah, CDC said, don't worry, you can still continue taking it. So it makes that, them feel better. That's interesting. They said to stop because to me, yeah. if you stop it, what if something happened? What if they have some sort of? It was all kind of unclear. I think that the point was that they need to get it switched mm-hmm. but yeah they, yeah. yeah i don't know it's been it's been not as bad as i thought it was gonna be um i, I it guess, was more like just two or three days of bad and now it's just a few extra people well what's good is i think like this usually doesn't happen but they were so good about getting all the information to everyone where mm-hmm. instead of us having to call all the physicians and let them know right it was like they were sw- sending over prescriptions to switch right. their patients so anyway the ph- physicians knew which yeah. was good it wasn't us calling and having to convince them to mm-hmm. switch everybody from valsartan to low sartan or the um birthday cake smelling olmosartan <laughs> it is a, it has a little bit of a birthday cake smell to yeah, it, some people it? like it I don't, I don't like it yeah not a fan no not at all but um yeah so it hasn't been as bad as i thought but it definitely uh, definitely has caused some confusion. And, you know, I think especially some of our elderly patients have been a little bit concerned because they've been used to this one medication yeah. for so long. Now we have to switch them. And my grandma takes it. Did you? Oh, yeah. Was she one of the ones that was affected? I think so. Yeah. And I told my mom. She's like, oh, it's probably fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mom. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Swanson. Yeah. Yeah. She always knows. Yep. I like it. That's good. She's probably fine. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, nothing bad from bad came from something like that. Yeah, yeah. But um, so yeah, today we are going to kind of review uh, hypothyroidism. Mm-hmm. Um, originally we talked about doing just regular, you know, hypo and hyper, just mm-hmm. thyroid disorders in general, and then we realized that hmm. We're going to run a topic super quick if, Eventually. We keep, if we keep combining things. There's only so many things you can talk about in the body. Yes. That um, we know about. I guess yeah, that's the real. That's the real. <laughs> that's the rate limiting factor. It really is. I, li- <laughs> I like how you were attributing that to science for, right. for a quick second. Not science's fault. Uh, it's our fault. Yeah. We'll so we're going to do hypothyroid. We'll eventually do hyperthyroid and probably sprinkle some thyroid storm in there as well, I think. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Um. So where, what do you want to start? you want to start off with just kind of how the thyroid, I guess, um, where it comes into play? Yeah, so um, hypothyroidism in particular is a very common endocrine disorder. You see levothyroxine filled and dispensed all over the place, and it's it's really, a, it can manifest itself in multiple places. So the, the pathway is kind of starts in the hypothalamus with release of thyroid-releasing hormone, goes to the pituitary gland, release of thyroid-stimulating hormone, then it goes to the thyroid gland and you get release of T4 to the peripheral tissues. 
and it's then activated to T3. There's a negative feedback loop to the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus to say, hey, stop um, giving out your hormones. We're, we're doing good down here. And, or when you don't have enough down there, then, hey, hypothalamus, pituitary, you need a little more. So send us some more T4 and T3. Send us some more T4 and T3. Kind of the, the basics of it, I guess. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Brian Gilbert, I see on the uh, Instagram comments, he's saying uh, to do um, the oh, yeah, um, we'll talk about it. coma as well, which we can. It'll be in there for sure. Everyone just presents with a coma, right? Yeah, everybody. You got hypothyroidism. <laughs> yeah, you got boom, a coma. coma. Yeah. No, but yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get to we'll it. We'll talk about that. And mixed edema coma is kind of the worst case scenario when it comes to hypothyroidism. And I did see enough, it once on, on a rotation. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, I did. Interest was a person in a coma? <laughs> they were. I know they were. Yeah. Which they, I don't think they actually no, were. No, they don't. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 they typically, it's more like delirium than yeah. an actual. It's a little, little mis, uh, misleading. Mis- yeah, definitely is. But, um, and then also, uh, did you mention how iodine um, plays no. a role? Go um, on. So, you know, iodine gets brought into the actual thyroid, and that's one of the uh, factors that plays a role in actually producing um, it binds with the thyroglobulin, and then that's um, kind of downregulates and, and releases the T4, T3 um, eventually from the thyroid gland itself. But um, the iodine plays a role because that's how we treat um, when we're trying to do, if we have like hyperthyroidism, mm-hmm. when we're doing ablation, we'll do I, uh, radioactive iodine. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it can come into play there. But uh, iodine does play a role in the thyroid, which is really the only place I think of I th- that's all I'm in aware the body. Of. Which it, it's interesting because we have a lot of, it seems like we have a lot of hypothyroidism. Compared to the rest of the world, we really don't. And the reason is uh, table salt. Hmm. You ever wonder why it says I- iodized and non-iodized salt? It's because they said just like um, fluoride in the water, we're going to add iodine to the salt. And uh, it helps convert, I think it helps convert T4 to T3. Don't quote me on that. T four T three, you're right. You think that's what it is? Okay, I think that's it's what get, it is. Well, it's getting it's it's producing T four, and then I guess the T four uh, releases an extra iodine, and that becomes T three. Yeah. Okay. Uh, either way, it uh, promotes thyroid levels, and that's why uh, the risk is lower in America. So if you have it um, frequently, it's autoimmune. A lot of times, it's Hashimoto's thyroiditis, but in other parts of the world, it can be because of an iodine deficiency, because they don't, um, you know put iodine in their salt right um so i was actually i had to go buy salt for the first time in like i mean it's got to be three or four years because you get those big tubs and you know last forever about 38 cents for a tub of it and i was like well what do i do non-iodized or iodized because i feel like my thyroid's fine do i need more never know i went with iodized i don't think i've bought salt ever in my whole life really yeah i don't put it on stuff I know I shouldn't. No, it's not. It's not even like that at all. Like, oh, like I'm so healthy. It's just, I think whenever I was doing the like the MMA stuff, mm-hmm. I got so used to eating bland food mm-hmm. that that's just what I eat now. Man, so I've never even thought about putting salt on. Something. I love steamed broccoli. It's got to have a little salt on. I, 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 sure I got to sprinkle some from salt a restaurant. On it's probably really good. I'm yeah. sure it has it on there. It's uh, it's totally not recommended, but I I definitely sprinkle salt on stuff. I hear you. So my thyroid's doing great. <laughs> Out of this world. <laughs> out of this world. We'll talk a little bit about uh, if your thyroid's doing too, a little too much. Are we going to talk about the hyper? I thought we said we weren't going to talk about We're hyper. not, but sometimes when you're treating hypo, you kind of, right, you get some right. of those symptoms. You're jumping ship. We, this is we're going back to the original plan. Right. That we said we weren't going to do. We talk about everything. Yeah, that's it. Let's bring in the gallbladder too. <laughs> let's, let's do it all. <laughs> all right. So um, you started to talk about the Hashimoto's. Um, anything else did you want to talk about? Anything else before we kind of get into the actual... Yeah, I mean, um, so signs and symptoms, it's the opposite of hyperthyroid. So frequently you're going to see weight gain, you might even see decreased appetite, which kind of doesn't seem like they go together, but it has to do with your metabolism. Fatigue, loss of energy, even dry skin. A lot of people comment on the hair loss is pretty common. Also psychiatric stuff like depression, emotional lability, um, fullness in the throat could be something because if you have a goiter... Uh, but those are common things you'll see. Obviously, there's differential diagnosis that's going to go into this, but um, we can be pretty accurate with with some blood levels, right? Yeah, and the the goiter, the goiter is going to be more so the 
hyper. Yeah. Um, but so in hypo, you probably wouldn't see that, but you, you know, that's one of the big kind of telltale signs of, of a hyperthyroidism. But, um, yeah, the, um, I always, and I always get them confused too, as far as the weight loss and, and weight, uh, weight gain. But like you said, um, the appetite, you actually start gaining weight, but the appetite goes down. It's kind of, kind of crazy. And then, um, um, you said bradycardia. Um, that's the other one that I get confused because when I think, you know, when you're thinking hyper, the the tachycardia and the potential for like AFib and like elderly patients and things, um, I always have a, a hard time remembering those two. But bradycardia is going to be more so with hypothyroidism. Right. So then we got to be careful when we're correcting that, kind of like you were talking about, um, especially in our elderly patients yep, or yep. ones with heart disease. Yeah, and so um, I mentioned the blood levels as well. So you're frequently going to get a TSH. Uh, if the TSH is elevated, then you'll probably get a T4. So if your TSH is elevated, your T4 is low. That means that the pituitary gland is trying to get you to make more T4, but it's not really working out, so you're hypothyroid. Yes, and to answer, um, I see another question from Instagram. Uh, Ryan asked, where's Blake? Um, yeah, where's Blake? <laughs> Blake's probably playing Xbox right now. <laughs> Slacking <laughs> off. Probably not, but <laughs> no. he uh, he couldn't make it today, so it's okay. We'll forgive him this one time. Just the one time. Yeah. It's just us today. Yep. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. The last thing, you can have an elevated TSH and uh, low to normal T4 levels. That is um, more of a subclinical hypothyroidism picture may not need to be treated sometimes they do with low levels of t4 yeah did you say um talk about the normal levels at all uh, i didn't really talk about what they were um so think normal levels of a free t4 uh, you're looking at 0.9 to about 2.3 nanograms per deciliter mm-hmm. um and then when you consider tsh um you know what we look for is like levels above 10 are definitely indicative of um, hypothyroidism yeah and remember that those have an inverse relationship um, you're not going to, if you get T4 going down, which is obviously the hypothyroidism, uh, TSH is going to increase because you're trying to, um, or we'll stay the same, but you're trying to, uh, your body's basically trying to produce that T4 because it realizes that it's, it's low. So it's trying to stimulate the thyroid to produce more, but that's another thing that can potentially get confusing. Yeah. And I think labs. there can be abnormal presentations where you have like a normal TSH or even low if it's like a central exactly. hypothyroidism. Exactly, if the pituitary is right. involved. if that's what's affected. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Then you, did, then you would definitely bring in T4. Right. Um, pregnancy, they definitely look at T4. Yeah, pregnancy, I don't think we'll talk about that too much, but um, you're going to need a lot more mm-hmm. thyroid Higher doses. Hormones, basically. Yep. It's kind of the idea there. Um, the other thing is too, um, when you're getting levels, so let's say you get a TSH, um, when you adjust a dose, you typically will wait four to six months before you actually reevaluate, um, because months or weeks, um, weeks, I'm sorry, weeks. Yes. Thank you. Um, because the half-life is about seven days, um, in order to get to steady state, you're thinking about five weeks, you know, so four to six is a good range to put you in a, a safe um, safe area as far as getting an accurate reading. Mm-hmm. Um, but you don't want to get the TSH level like a week after you switch doses. It's right. probably not going to be not accurate. Be accurate. And normal reference range is around 0.4 to like 4.2. I think that's kind of debatable, but um, generally. Yeah. So if it's high, that's where you're getting the T4. And I don't think they standardly get T3s. I don't really think that that serves too much yeah. of a purpose. Yeah, they don't usually get T3s um, unless it's a very like specific... Right. Maybe if they're um, resistant and they think that it might be an issue of converting T4 to T3, so they want to add on leothyronin, I think Mm -hmm. they might get a T3 in that case. Yeah. And we'll talk about that, too. Um, Do you want to start off with uh, levothyroxine, I guess? Yeah. The the gold standard. So what do you treat uh, hypothyroidism with? Levothyroxine. T4. Synthetic T4. Um, the, The thing that, I guess caused a lot of confusion is instead of having one manufacturer mm-hmm. that made levothyroxine, um, there was four brand names. Mm-hmm. Um, now there's a, a fifth one that's a capsule form that's a little bit easier to distinguish, but there was four brand name tablet forms. So they had the brand name Synthroid, they had brand name Lavoxyl, they mm-hmm. had Unithroid, and they had Levothyroid. Um, and then 
they were all levothyroxines. Uh, and typically when we think of switching to a generic medication, we think of them as being right. very accurate and we don't worry about it. We just switch them to generic. Right. The problem with levothyroxine, if you think about it, it's one of the only medications that we have that they're dosing intervals. You know, you're talking, you could have a dose that's 75 micrograms and then another dose that comes stock as an 88 microgram. So you're talking very, very small amounts Teeny of changes tiny. can can change levels. And so when you're talking about tiny variances in the uh, going from generic to brand, um, it can actually affect the level. So that's what they were worried about. They didn't want someone being on Synthroid, getting their TSH mm -hmm. stable, T4 stable, and then being switched to a different generic that was like the generic of Lavoxyl, let's say. And then all of a sudden those levels were no longer uh, level, you know, no longer accurate. So that was a big deal for a while. You were had a lot of patients who were uh, very much stuck on one particular brand mm -hmm. and you would not change that for the generic or you would get an angry phone call. Right. And, uh, you know, we'll get a lot of questions from patients saying, hey, I was taking the brand. This is just generally for anything taking the brand now i'm on the generic but you know they want to stay on the brand because that worked better for them so you've got to explain to them that it's bioequivalent bioequivalent and all that kind of stuff but this is one case where yeah if uh, the brand may actually matter and there is a there is a particular uh generic manufacturer that does um make an equivalent generic to all four products so they've actually had it tested um compared to all four um that's the myelin brand um, that one is considered equivalent to all four of them, but it's the only one that's like that. Um, and then they have Lynette is equivalent to three of the four. Um, but if you're ever like trying to figure out if the brand that you have is the actual generic of, let's say, Synthroid and not Unithroid, um, then you can look at the FDA's Orange Book, which is something we, I think, mm -hmm. in 2018 kind of forget that <laughs> it's available. Um, it's conveniently available online now instead of the gigantic Orange Book. So sitting on the it's, shelf. It's probably not orange anymore. It's probably just an app. But yeah. orange, the app is orange. It got orange background. Yeah. Okay. There you go. But uh, you can look up that, and it'll tell you um, which generics are equivalent to which brands. So things like um, Diltiazem. Mm -hmm. You can use it for that, and it'll tell you they use A B ratings. So it'll say A B one, A B two, and you can match it up with the brand name. That way, there's no confusion, and you can double check yourself. Yep. So that's T4. And uh, standard dosing, if you just wanted you know, a general dose, a lot of people go with 50 to 75. Um, might even go up to 100. But you can do a weight-based dose, which I think is in the package insert, uh, at about 1.7 mics per kg. And that's just for a, yeah, that's mild hypothyroidism for a standard patient that is doesn't have cardiovascular disease and is under 50 years old. We should also say that this is most common in females as well. It is, yeah. And that's when, you, when you're using kilograms to measure the dosing, keep in mind it is ideal body weight. Okay, um, good point. So if you have an obese patient, you're not going off of their actual body weight. Yeah. So you have to do some math real quick. Yeah, and initial dosing shouldn't exceed about 300 mics per day. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, you know, a lot of patients may be fine to just start off on a start off on a smaller dose so especially think adults even adults less than 50 um, who have heart disease you can probably realistically start them out around 25 to 50 mm -hmm. um, and then safely move them up from there um, you know you move them up 12.5 to 25 mics uh, each six to eight week period mm -hmm. and that way you're not running the risk of um, causing any kind of arrhythmias or anything like that and then especially when you get start getting over 50 or over 60 um, you know you, you can kind of follow the same logic um, and then you would want to use even more caution in the heart disease patients in that group, that age group. Yep. And that's standard dosing. Severe hypothyroidism, you're going to get different stuff, even subclinical hypothyroidism. Um, Lexicom is a good resource or the yeah. package insert if you're wondering what dosing you want to start with. So that's levothyroxine. So that's T4. There's also T3, and that's leothyronin. And there are a couple of brand names for that. Cytomel is probably the most common. And there's also Triostat. Uh, standardly, we don't need to give patients T3, just if you're, you know, primary care and you're treating somebody for a regular case of hypothyroidism, uh, but there are certain cases with resistant patients where you might want to combine them. Yeah, and, the, and it's one of those things that the guidelines, so the guidelines don't really recommend the T3 because all the, the data that we have, um, you know, these big meta-analyses that have compared 
the T4 by itself to T4 plus T3 always end up having like the same results. We don't see a difference, so why give two drugs when we can give one? Um, I will say, though, there was a secondary analysis, like a subgroup analysis, where there was this certain like polymorphism that was present in these patients um, when it, in regards to T4, and it was a way basically that they responded to being on just the plain levothyroxine. And in those particular patients, it does seem that uh, it's possible they may benefit from T3 as well. Um, you know, the other thing to keep in mind, let's say you have their levels completely set. They're good, you know, on paper, they look fine, but they just come up to you and they're saying that they just don't feel right. Mm -hmm. They're tired. They may be, you know, basically describing like depressed types symptoms. Um, one thing to consider is, you know, when we think about like the star D trial, one of the step three procedures that they did was give them cytomel T3 and it was effective in some of the patients in that group. So that's one thing you could consider is if, even if the patient is normal thyroid levels, um, but just not quite feeling right, you could consider T3 in that patient as well. Um, and just really closely monitor them. Yeah. And some other places to consider it would be if they have impaired GI absorption, uh, it has kind of a quick turnaround, a short half-life of about 12 to 24 hours. So dosage adjustments really easy, um, or at least you can do it quick, more quickly than with, uh, T4. Or if you think peripheral conversion from T4 to T3 is impaired, then you might want to supplement with some T3 and combine them. But it's really, it's not meant for a sole maintenance therapy. It's supposed to be combined with T4 if it's used. Right. Um, And I think we should mention too, um, when you're taking T4, so levothyroxine, um, we didn't really mention, I I don't believe you mentioned, um, actually taking it on an empty stomach. Yeah. um, Making sure, we typically always used to say the morning. Right. Like always take it in the morning, take it 30 to 60 minutes before breakfast, take it by itself with a glass of water, um, you know, don't have it with milk or anything like that, don't take it with any other meds. Um, so that is all still true. However, there is evidence now that shows that it's okay to take it at night. Mm-hmm. Um, we just want to make sure that it's four hours after the last meal so you can get close to having an empty stomach and you still want to separate it from um, taking it with other medications. Right, or food. Yeah, especially things that are like the multivalent um, cations, so magnesium, calcium, iron, you know, things that are found in like antacids. Uh, You want to make sure that you're separating them because they will bind and not allow you to absorb the levothyroxine. So you're going to be on whopping doses of T4, but uh, you're still going to be hypothyroid because you're not absorbing any of it. Yes, and um, we did, you mentioned the adverse effects a little bit, um, but keep in mind if we go slow with the dose, um, we probably will be able to avoid a lot of those. There's some people who can take levothyroxine and be completely fine. Right. Um, and I know we're not really going to get into the pregnancy guidelines, but this is just a side note because I've had a few people ask me, like, well, is it safe in pregnancy? Um, if we go by the old pregnancy categories, it's actually category A, which is, you know. The safest. The safest, yeah. <laughs> well, you don't really see too many of those. Which I, I think until they have, like, um, I think they have to look at it with each medication and take the category away. I think we're allowed to use them until they've done that yeah. with the medication. Well, right? and I think it's, the new drugs are the ones that don't have right, they those don't have categories. It. And they're going back and doing some, but I don't think they've done very many. So if yeah. they haven't, we can say category A. We're yeah. not wrong. Cool. Yeah, I think. It's That's easy my understanding. Me, it's easy for me to remember that. Yes, it's a lot easier. Instead of having to read the whole paragraph, and right. that's not safe. Oh my gosh, I just want the forever. one letter. Yeah, that's I like, all I, like I have the time grade. for. <laughs> hey, look, Blake's uh, just joined us on Instagram. Oh. Hey, Blake, it's nice to see you uh, on there instead of being here in this room with us. You we, playing we, Xbox? We miss you. That's the question. That is the question. There is one more thyroid product, and that's the uh, desiccated thyroid. Brand names would be Armor Thyroid, Nature Thyroid, or West Thyroid. I think people are really kind of getting away from this for the most part, um, but it is a combination of T4 and T3 because they're taking porcine thyroid glands or even bovine, which I had to look up, but that's like cattle, I suppose, cow and oxen and things. <laughs> uh, and porcine is pigs, but anyways, good good information to have. Generally, the it's in a ratio of about 1 to 4, T3 to T4, uh, but when you're combining T3 and T4 for treatment, frequently you want to have it Uh, at a ratio that's much higher in T4 than T3. So like a 10 to 1 ratio, T4 to T3, up to 14 to 1 ratio, T4 to T3. So that might be a reason why people are kind of getting away from them. Yeah. Um, And and there is some speculation, too, that you may not be able to get, 
you know, be able to predict the true potency when they're right. in combination like that. Yeah. If you think about it, they're taking a, a pig's thyroid and smashing it up and making a delicious, what desiccated means, a, deli- yeah. a delicious tablet for you. <laughs> so it's kind of crazy. Um, yeah, the, the other thing that's weird too about the uh, desiccated thyroid is it's typically presented in grains. Mm-hmm. So they measure it in grains. So it'll be, Throws you off. um, yeah. So you're, you're thinking, you know, 60 to 65 grains. Um, and so that's, we typically just don't see things like other than what is it? I guess phenobarb was mm-hmm. some, not too many things are measured in that anymore. Um, and I, I believe it's grains of wheat, isn't it? Like, isn't that what that grain actually is? Is that what, is what they, they compared it to? Yeah, it's oh, like a grain of wheat. That makes more sense. Yeah. So 65 pretty. little grains of wheat, or mm-hmm. 64, or whatever, is like one milligram. Yeah, grains of wheat. <laughs> well, then what, is a, then what is a milligram? Milligram? That's just the, that's the real science. I know that's the real science, but no, no real world uh, I don't know. My favorite unit of measure, now that we've totally gone off the rails, is when you see people uh, and they're measuring things in stones. Uh-huh. I believe they do that in, um, I want to say England. They can measure things in stones. You'll hear uh, even like, um, like MMA fighters. They get measured instead of pounds. They're, they Oh, he guy weighed in at 12 stones. <laughs> what? I was like, what? I want to be measured in stones. Because he's rock hard. Yeah, yeah, I think that's just how they measure stuff. But right. that's... Uh, Interesting. And but then their dollars or pounds. What are they doing over there? Uh, it's crazy. It's a whole new world. <laughs> it's a whole, whole new world. But um, yeah, so that is uh, the main treatment options we have for uh, hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism. Fortunately, it's it's pretty straightforward um, until it's not. You know, the initial yeah. treatment's pretty straightforward. And um, like I said earlier, I mentioned earlier the levothyroxine capsules. Uh-huh. Um, brand name uh, Tiracent. I believe, yeah, Tiersen. Um They're very expensive, and I have not seen any good data that shows that they're necessarily better. Um, so just be aware of that if you have your patients on the capsule version. Um, you know, it's just ma- make sure that their insurance is covering it because a lot of the insurance companies do not pay for it. So, gotcha. Fun facts. Yeah. So, myxedema coma. Myxedema coma. Basically, that's just a very severe form of hypothyroidism um frequently t4 levels might be undetectable mm-hmm. so what are you gonna do give them a whole bunch of t4 right yep IV. as fast as we can to give it to them and um they i think the technical term they, they use is uh, decompensated thi- hypothyroidism so it's like just like you said super severe and it can be precipitated by a whole bunch of different things um you know trauma infections heart failure exacerbation definitely medications um, you know, something like old amiodarone that can't make up its mind and causes hyper and hypo thyroidism, <laughs> if that's not confusing enough. Um, but there's a whole bunch of things that can cause it. And so, you know, like, like you're saying, T4 levels are just almost undetectable, if detectable at all. And, um, you know, the person has uh, a completely altered mental state. They're usually not in a true coma. That's what we were joking about earlier. Um, you know, that's kind of misleading, but they're usually just more of an altered mental state. Um, you may see some, like, diastolic hypertension, some hypothermia, hypoventilation, things like that, um, and then they'll progressively get worse as they go. Right. So you give them the T4 IV. Uh, you give initial uh, bolus doses, then 24 hours later you give them some more, and then the next day you give them some more, along with stress doses of IV glucocorticoids mm-hmm. so they're going to be getting t4 they're going to be getting steroids and you monitor and i think um our patient did pretty well overall she had some other stuff going on but that was definitely uh, primary and i think in that particular case because they're giving an iv um they give hydrocortisone yeah um, 100 milligrams every eight hours um i can't i don't know off the top of my head and i probably should know why the particular they're using hydrocortisone in that case do you know no uh, we talked about it. I think it was, I don't know, it might have just been the cheapest thing at the time, but I'm yeah, sure, there's, I a, think, I'm sure think, there's a better reason. Uh, yeah, I feel like I think a lot of people um, recommend the hydrocortisone over the other ones. Because um, I know things in like uh, like thyroid storm, when they're using corticosteroids, they usually, they usually use a dexamethasone. Mm-hmm. But um, hydrocortisone is the one you keep seeing pop up in uh Myxedema coma. Yeah, I'm sure there's a good reason. We'll have to look that up. We'll we post it on it. the gram. Yeah, we'll get it on the gram. Uh, as far as complications of treating hypothyroidism in general, there's always that risk of overshooting a little bit. So you're going to get um, 
symptoms of hyperthyroidism, which are basically the opposite of hypo. And uh, see our future hyperthyroidism podcast for more information on that. Yes. Um, they, uh, they say that I'm going to read some of these stats from a study because, um, you know, what's the prognosis of myxedema coma? Um, you know, obviously, like we said, endocrine emergency. Um, and they did a report of 149 Japanese patients with myxedema coma. The mortality was 30%, the mortality rate. Um, older age, cardiac complications, reduced consciousness, um, need for mechanical ventilation, persistent hypothermia, sepsis um, were all predictive elements of mortality. So, um, you know, it's one of those things that you can kind of figure if uh, you have some other serious things going on, which unfortunately is what can pre- precipitate out that in the first place. Right. Um, and I know some places, especially if they are, if it looks like an infection of some sort has caused, you know, this makes pneumocoma to come about, um, they will start empiric antibiotics until they can kind mm-hmm. of um, wean the patient off and figure out exactly, you know, um, which, which antibiotics the patient needs to be on. Um, but uh, they'll start empiric antibiotics to hopefully ward off that infection and increase the probability of that person making a recovery. So it's pretty severe. Pretty severe. Pretty big deal. Anything with coma, it's probably pretty severe. It's not great. No. Yes. Anything else with, uh, um, you know, sometimes uh, you will have to do, like we said, mechanical ventilation, but mm-hmm. you also have to do um, like rewarming Um Patients, like I said, come in with like hypothermia. You'll use warming blankets, um, fluids. Mm -hmm. uh, Potentially, um, if the patient goes hypotensive after a while, vasopressors. Um, So yeah, it just really kind of depends on the patient's um, what exact profile they're presenting with and what's going on with them individually. Right. But there's a lot of different supportive measures that we need to look at. Yeah. So not good. Yep. I should also mention um, elderly patients, your doses are going to be different as well, probably lower. So just double check if you have a patient greater than 50, greater than 60, especially greater than 70. Um, Treatment can even increase risk for fractures potentially. It's not the strongest length, but they they believe that it's related. Uh, So just keep an eye out, especially patients who are osteoporotic. Yep. That's hypothyroidism. That's it. Um, real quick, let's, uh, since it's almost the end of July already, and let's just run through in case anybody hasn't seen them, run through just some of the new drugs that have been approved this month. Sure. Want to do that? Sure. Um, so the first one that got approved in July was T-pox, which is the first smallpox treatment. Yeah, I saw that. Um, pretty interesting, but it's a, uh, orthopoxivirus specific antiviral. And, um, yeah, as far as I know, first of, uh. First of its kind, um, from what I've seen, anyway, um, and it's actually. I think there was a resurgence treatment. of smallpox, like mm-hmm. in uh, California or something. Yep, like five hundred cases. The anti-vaxxers. Yeah. Uh oh. Yep. And then um, we also have uh, Simtuza, which is a new HIV treatment option, um, and it is the imtricitabine and tenofovir alafenamide, so TAF, um, in combination with darunavir and cobigastat. Mm-hmm. So it's a um, protease inhibitor um, combo with TAV. It's a boosted um, protease inhibitor. So um, that's it, it's another one of our single tablet treatment options. Um, but it is effective. Uh, you got to watch out for the uh, drug drug interactions with um, Cobigastat. Um, and it's probably going to be one of those that we have to see it compete with emtricitabine, tenofovir, and the Bictegravir that uh, was approved a few months ago from um, Gilead Pharmaceuticals. Right. Because that's, you know, the first, that was the first unboosted integrated strain inhibitor. So right. that's definitely uh, a now good one. They're making one. strides, yeah. HIV-wise. Big time. Yep. And a lot come out the last couple couple months. Yep. And this was the end of June, uh, but I thought this one was pretty interesting. Epidiolex uh, was another cannabidiol um medication before we had dronabinol, which I think is mainly used for appetite stimulation, Mm -hmm. right? So this was actually used to treat rare, severe forms of epilepsy. Uh, So they are moving into that market, uh, seeing what works. People are all about it. And we got another new FDA-approved drug. 
yeah, there's a lot of people starting to look at like CBD and um, seeing what they can use for treatment options of, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of good data now with, you know, working against seizures and, um, you know, other other issues as well. But definitely, uh, I'm glad that they're at least doing the research now and, and able to present a lot of that. And there's not as much stigma as there was right. before about it. It's good. Especially if we can if we can help some people out. Uh, we had Zemdri, which is the um, plasmacin injection for UTI. So it's an aminoglycoside um, indicated for the treatment of complicated urinary tract infections. Um, what else? A couple other random things. Always some good um, oncology drugs coming out. Yes, they're always making strides. Pretty every, much every over month. my head for the most part, but we're always getting new stuff. There was a... Um, Crintafel, Tafa Tafiniquin. Yes, the new malaria drug. Malaria radical cure for malaria. They say cure; it, it more prevents relapse. Um, but it's a Plasmodium vivax malaria cure. Mm-hmm. I think that's. that's I, I don't know. You know, I don't. I don't know enough about it to know if that's going to be you know a humongous deal. But it sounds like a big deal to me. Yeah, I think it's the first like. I want to say it's, I heard somebody say it was like the first like new malaria drug that we've had in i mean years oh yeah so i believe it um it's that's pretty cool um and then uh yeah the other one we um we had this month was the um tipsova which is the acute myeloid leukemia med that's new um isocitrate dehydrogenase one inhibitor um for patients with relapsed or refractory acute myeloid leukemia um with specifically a um idh1 mutation so, like Cole said, that's that's above my head, but um, sure, it means new, something new, important. New drug, and uh, it's awesome that they're making such huge strides in the oncology world. There's so much research. You know, much I mean, I mean, crazy drugs are probably on the verge of coming out in oncology. I, I mean, don't know. It's crazy. So somebody knows. Yeah, I, I, it's amazing. I'm sure. Um, Especially how I mean, just how fast everything's moving. It's, who was the Who was great. the oncology pharmacist we had on? Uh, Jordan. Miller. Yeah, but Jordan knows. Oh yeah, I'm sure he's. And probably involved in some of it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he's he's usually on the up and up with that. Cool. All right, man. Anything else we need to go over? That's all I got. Cool. We'll do uh, hyperthyroid at some point in the near future. Mm-hmm. Um, got some guests lined up to uh, hopefully come on here and share some knowledge. So you're not stuck listening to us like always. Oh yeah. And um, some non-pharmacy uh, voices in the house. Yes, for we gotta, sure. Definitely got to get those. PAs, physicians, nurses. We're gonna get. We got some other people in here. We, we got some be, lined up. Can't be too one sided. Mm-hmm. But um, yes, thank you guys so much for listening and um, you know the support. We really appreciate it. Uh, if you do like the podcast, please leave us a comment or a rating on iTunes or wherever else you listen to it on. It really helps us out. Um, check us out on Instagram or any of the other social media platforms. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to email us. You can message us on Facebook, Instagram, whatever you want. And we will hopefully get to talk to you guys soon. Have a great rest of your week. Later.